Good evening and welcome to the High Votes Candidate Forum for the Los Angeles City Council District 6. I am Ruben Carapetian, the Government Affairs Director of the ANCA Western Region. I am joined by my co-moderator, Ara Hachaturian, Editor-in-Chief of Aspares, which is one of the oldest Armenian-American bilingual daily newspapers published here in Los Angeles, California. The ANCA Western Region is the largest and most influential Armenian-American community organization in the United States. We've been working over 75 years to advance the social, economic, and political interests of the Armenian-American community. And High Votes is a nonpartisan initiative of the ANCA Western Region established in 2012 to help educate and mobilize Armenian-American voters. We're proud to have the two candidates for the Los Angeles City Council District 6 here with us, Marissa Alcaraz and Emilda Padilla, join us tonight at this forum to discuss issues of importance to the Armenian American and other communities in CD6. Los Angeles is one of the most diverse cities in the world, especially in city, CD6, where Im immigrant communities like Armenians, Latinos, and so many others have banded together to make Los Angeles the global economic and cultural hub that it is today. As an immigrant community, Armenian Americans share many common experiences, needs, and struggles with our friends and neighbors in CD6, which demonstrates now more than ever the need for our collective advocacy to build prosperous and empowered communities that are welcoming to all. Like so many who, immigra who immigrated uh, to the United States fleeing genocide, political turmoil, and seeking new opportunity, we look, to a proud, we look to proud examples of civic stewardship and po from policymakers like Paul Krikorian, who as LA City Council President serves as a golden standard for all Armenian Americans and children of immigrants who wish to enact change in their communities. Truly, the Armenian American community has matured politically over the years. As immigrants eventually become citizens and as their children who are born here become eligible to vote, run for office, and run for office as ordinary citizens of Los Angeles. Armenian American voters same, uh, uh, face the same issues and concerns as other voters when it comes to the economy, crime, homelessness, jobs, education, health care, and public safety. However, we face uh, issues that are unique to our community, which have rocked us to our very core, such as the existential threat we are fa currently facing in our ancestral homeland uh, at the hands of a genocidal regime in Baku and the concerning preval uh, prevalence of hate crimes targeting our communities here in Los Angeles. We are holding this forum tonight to give the candidates for Los Angeles City Council District 6 an opportunity to share their views on issues that are important to our, uh, our, our community. The NCAWR has provided both candidates qu with questionnaires and has held interviews with both prior to organizing this forum. Tonight, the candidates will be asked questions about their position on a variety of issues, including but not limited to the Armenian cause, education, health care, the economy, public safety, housing, among others. We encourage you to listen carefully to the candidates' and, uh, answers and submit your questions in writing. There will be no questions, uh, uh, there will be no questions uh, in, uh, that will be heard other than questions in writing. There are, pens, uh, there are papers and pens in front of you and around you. If you need more, please flag down Eddie. Eddie, raise your hand. Please flag down Eddie. Uh, we also want to thank the Vatican Banquet Hall uh, owner, Anna Hakopian, thank you very much, and uh, manager, Arman Parsandian, for graciously allowing us to hold this forum at their venue. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. I hope you find this forum informative and, help, and helpful before you cast your ballot in this race by June 27th, 2023. Ara? Thank you, everyone. Good evening, and thank you both for uh, joining us today. Um, I want to start this uh, candidate forum by talking about why we're here and why there's a special election. Uh, the person you're seeking to replace on city council uh, was part of one of the largest scandals that our city council has seen because she was caught uh, on tape among other officials making very uh, disgusting and racist remarks about people in <coughs> the black community, in the Latinx community, and the Armenian community, the LGBT community, 
the list goes on. Let's start off by talking about how you feel about uh, this situation and how, if elected, will you look to truly address the diversity in our city and uh, lead it? Let's start with you, Ms. Padilla. Is there a time? Okay. Um, so I'll start by saying that the way I felt and still feel today um, after this happened was that I was very um, angry, very sad, very embarrassed, and very disappointed. Um, it have messed with me and my psyche for quite a while that I ended up taking off an entire week off of work just so that I can really think through um, the emotions and unpackaging everything that had just happened. Um, I think it's a, a shame that you had a group of leaders that, you know, they were in a situation where the topic of race was discussed, but they did it in a way that was very racist, and I think that that's very inappropriate which is why that very night, I actually posted um, condemning the actions on my uh, personal Instagram page, and I still feel that sentiment today. Now, what do I plan to do to address the diversity and bring healing to this community? You know, as someone that's been a community organizer for a very long time, and learned how to do organizing from the uh, labor side of things, I have uh, experience in the process of bringing people from uh, different opinions uh, together to the table so that we can uh, engage in healing and engage in productive conversations that build community and build unity and allow us to focus on the things that bring us together as opposed to the atrocious things and those comments that um, broke us apart. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, like, like many people, I, I too was surprised and saddened really by, by what occurred for our, for our city. I, I don't think it was a good reflection of us as Los Angeles and as a community. We are home to such a diverse group of people and that's kind of what makes us great in Los Angeles. You know, LA is you know, home to the largest Armenian community outside of Armenia, for example, and to many other communities. So it was very hurtful what was said and and not appropriate coming from elected leaders of our city. And I joined a, a vigil that night and you know, called on the members to resign. I will say I have never worked for Mary Martinez or anyone from her political machine, unlike my opponent. And I've been part of a very diverse team uh, led by African Americans and Latinos who are about community unity and building up a coalition. And that's what I'm gonna bring to this seat new blood and change and leadership that's about inclusivity and uplifting every one of our community all at once and being better leaders for the next generation. Uh, thank you. Um, it, it, it's, it's strange because I, as I was coming here, I read an article in the Los Angeles Times today where one of the leading law firms in the country that happens to be in Los Angeles just released a trove of emails from two of its partners, again, targeting uh, the communities that we've just addressed. Uh, but we, as Armenian genocide survivors or uh, descendants of them, are facing new and more gruesome attacks here in Los Angeles uh, where our entire national identity is be being placed under question through flyers, through statements, through uh, assaults. As members of the city council, and I have to say, I used to live in North Hollywood when I first moved to uh, Los Angeles more than three decades ago. And it was the first time, however, that I was uh, driving through these streets and it has become rather an Armenian uh, American neighborhood. So you will be leading a constituency that is uh, enveloped in this uh, reality. How do you look at this issue and what would you do as a city council member to specifically address 
Armenophobia, as we call it, uh, and hatred toward Armenians, where people are trying to erase us from this world. So CD6 has a, a huge Armenian population and it's, it's ever growing, I think, as people get priced out of nearby areas in, in Glendale and other places. I see more and more of my neighbors in Panorama City and Lake Balboa and Arleta and, and all around. And so I think that's why it's important to have you know, cultural centers. I know there's one just outside of CD6. Um, in Council District 3 that I recently visited. I know the fire station on Balboa, um, which is also just outside CD6, is gonna be a new community center as well. And I think uh, you know the East Valley area would be a great place to have an additional one. I know Assemblymember Nazarian is bringing a new center to North Hollywood, Tumo, which is gonna bring new technology center to the area, the first of its kind in the United States. Um, great friend and supporter of mine, and I look forward to working with him. You know, North Hollywood um, is kind of split between CD6 and CD2, so I think having that great relationship between the districts will help to promote, you know, a, a greater sense of, 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 you know, working together and bringing things and, and resources to the area. The, the hate crimes um, are just unacceptable, period. They, they cannot be tolerated. I live uh, very close to St. Peter's actually, right on Sherman Way. And I remember in, um, I believe it was 2020, um, when there was the issues going on and they had some of their uh, windows smashed over there and in an act of hate. So these kinds of things just cannot be tolerated. We have to prosecute them to the full extent of the law. And you know we have to just bring more cultural events and, and understanding and recognition for, for all of us to understand each other's cultures and then hopefully, you know, I'll learn from each other and uplift the communities. Thank you, Ms. Padilla. Thank you. Well, while I do have experience working at the city and county level because local governance is my passion, I'm very proud of the two years that I worked for Council District 6 as a field deputy for Panorama City, and I got a lot done, close to 10 community cleanups in over 18, in within the course of 18 months. I fixed up the library. I hosted a cult, an arts and cultural fair on Blight Street. So while some people might not see that as something positive, I will always cherish those years that and those months that I was a Council District 6 deputy. I think it speaks more to my work ethic versus the uh, elected leader that I work for. In fact, our current state senator, Carolyn Menjivar, who has endorsed me, also worked as a field deputy in District 6. And we learned a lot. We built up our own resumes and stories from that era. Um, however, to go back to your question, I'm well aware that currently there is a lot of um, things going on internationally that is working against the self-determination of both Armenia and Arsak um, through the uh, blockade of the pathways of the region that's in between both of those countries. And I believe that the reason why, or those spaces rather, in the geographical area, I believe that the reason why the Armenian Council of America PAC and the Armenians Rights Council of America, as well as uh, Glendale Mayor Artie Karsakian and my former opponent Rose Gregorian chose to endorse me because from the very beginning I told them that I am well aware and I actually admire the way that our local Armenian community has a very strong relationship and desire to get involved with the international issues that you face with your motherland and if I am granted the opportunity to be your city council person, not only will I fight against the hate crimes that happen to your community, but you can see me as an ally that is willing to use my bully pulpit to write letters in alliance to support you to um, push federal leaders, to push global leaders, to make sure that the sort of determination of your motherland is kept intact. Thank you. Uh, just today, Mayor Karen Bass and City Council President Paul Krikorian addressed a letter to uh, President Joe Biden and Secretary of State Antony Blinken regarding this specific issue. They demanded that our federal leaders uh, act on this issue. I mean, um, 
Yes, it is tens of thousands of miles away from where we're sitting now in Van Nuys, but it is something that is deeply part and parcel of uh, your constituents' uh, reality. So as city council members, uh, in addition to perhaps supporting this initiative by Mayor Bassin, uh, uh, President Krikorian, what will you do as far as engaging the constituents to address these issues? Let's start with you. Yeah. Well, I'm happy to say I, I have the, the support and endorsement of the Council President, Paul Krikorian, and you know I think that his leadership on this issue has, has been fantastic, along with our mayor and calling on the president um, to act. You know, the United States and, and Armenia have had a, a long history together, working together ever since, you know, they were declared independent many years ago. I, I, fortunate, I went uh, to the church the other day in, in Burbank for the 105th anniversary to commemorate that. and. You know, I think that the United States and, and Los Angeles in particular, being the city that has such a large Armenian population, that it's incumbent upon us to talk about this issue, whether that be on social media or through resolution or through letters and writing to our president and writing on our, on our state leaders to, to talk about this issue and to call out what is actually happening. I was really happy to go to the to the march on April 24th um, at, at the embassy there on Wilshire calling on Azerbaijan to stop what they're doing, to stop the blockade. I think we all know this is a humanitarian issue. When you're blocking food and supplies and healthcare and all the necessities to a small country, it, it just should not be tolerated. It is, it is unacceptable. And so I believe the United States needs to do more, we need to step in, we need to divest from, from Turkey and, and keep pushing forward and, and let people know about what's going on and what's happening. Can you repeat the question? Uh, my question was today, uh, Mayor Bass and Paul Krikorian, the president of city council, uh, uh, sent a second letter to President Biden and uh, Antony Blinken, the Secretary of State, urging action by the White House on this uh, impending humanitarian disaster that's happening right now. As a, someone who will be representing a rather large swath of Armenians in uh, Los Angeles, how will you in addition to hopefully supporting this initiative, engage others to address this matter. Okay, great, thank, thank you. So I'm running to represent, you know, people that live in District 6 at a very local level. However, as my neighbors, you know, individual Armenian communities living in District 6, this is a federal issue, right? And one of the things that the Armenian community has in common with my community, the Mexican American community, is that we're both immigrants, right? And as immigrant communities, I think what we need to do is find a way to work together to put pressure on all of the federal leaders that overlap with the city of LA and the county of LA to make sure that they are all in alliance with working together when they go over to Washington to make sure that they are pressuring our vice president and our president to um, you know, show that within the Los Angeles region, this is important for us as a place of immigrant communities. So we need to do that together so that whether it's the Congress member of the Valley or the Congress member of the West Side or the South Side or Central, that they understand that while they might disagree on some things, things related to um, the disenfranchisement and the, la uh, and the destroying of the self-determination of the Armenian people is something that we are not going to take lightly and we need them to take seriously in their conversations with our federal leaders. But in addition to that, you know, one of the things that has really inspired me um, in the campaign trail when I went to go uh, celebrate the commemoration of the Armenian genocide and we celebrated it in Culver City 
one of the things that I was inspired to do was I said, and I said this to some of my supporters in the room, why do we have to go to Culver City to celebrate this? We have many Armenian neighbors in the valley that we can bring to a local park and commemorate together, and it'll give an opportunity for also, you know, those individuals in the Armenian community that can drive to go to something local. And it'll also give the opportunity to bring other people that are not necessarily of Armenian descent to learn more about each other, and that's how you build community. Thank you for that. In the same vein, as Otto mentioned, uh, the Azerbaijani and Turkish governments are relentless, relentless in their efforts to obfuscate the facts about the Armenian genocide, what's happening in Artsakh right now, among other topics. Um, they've actively disparaged the Ar Armenian American community of Los Angeles and also called the Armenian diaspora their number one enemy. Um, if elected, what steps would you take to fight disinformation from, and foreign government influence in, from entering the city hall? Yes, yes. Well, again, I think it, it comes down to awareness. You know, if the council can, yes, we can do the resolutions, yes, we can write letters, yes, we can do social media campaigns, um, but, you know, it has, it has to be more than that. It has to be our communities coming together, calling attention to the issue, you know, when you, in, in 2020, when there was the 44-day war, I don't think it got a lot of coverage because of COVID and everything else happening. And, and when those types of things happen, that's when people get away with things. And, and when the genocide happened and, and the reason, and they still don't recognize it and they still don't want to call it a genocide, but that's what it was. You, when, you, when you annihilate one and a half million Armenian people and another million people of other Christian faiths, that then that's what, that's what you're doing. And, and we have to call attention to that. We have to remember our history because if you don't, it, it repeats itself. And so, you know, you have my full support and commitment to keep attention on these issues and working with other leaders of this community to, to call attention to it, to, to push for commemorative events, you know, um, Yes, the, the federal government has, has talked about the genocide before in their bills, but we don't have our own city holiday, for example, to commemorate. And I think April 24th should be a, a, you know, a city holiday, and we should recognize that to try and build more awareness for, for what happened then and what's also happening now. Melba? So I think the, the best way to keep that kind of thing out of City Hall is to elect me. Um, that's supposed to be a joke. No, but um, the thing is, uh, you know, I think the best way to keep um, that side of, that sort of, you know, lack of unity on behalf of, of your, you know, these outside forces trying to erase your history and trying to erase your, your issues is to continue to support what you just called the number, their number one enemy, which is the Armenian diaspora, right? So I would say that we have to continue to support um, those of you who are engaged in the Armenian diaspora, continue to stay strong, continue to raise money, continue to, you know, create awareness with other people. Um, and as you continue to do that, you know, continue to stay engaged with all leaders so that we as leaders can continue to stay um, informed about what are the current issues, what exactly are the next steps, and that way we can continue to be allies to make sure that that stays out of City Hall. Thank you. The reason uh, the 2020 war did not receive adequate coverage and issues that are happening right now in that area of the world are not receiving coverage. It's not because of COVID, it's because it's not Ukraine. But uh, we'll uh, move towards something else. So this is just to illustrate that your soon to be constituents have kind of an added layer, but they're also engaged with everything else that is con of concern to Angelinos. Uh, affordable housing, homelessness, uh, jobs uh, and 
and a safe community. I want to talk about something because, again, I'm going to go back to Mayor Karen Bass. One of the first things that she did when she took office is declare a state of emergency on the homelessness issue. Uh, I'm going to pass it to you, Ms. Padilla, to address this issue first. Homelessness. So yes, um, it's at the very top of my to-do list and desire of uh, things to address upon entering the, the position. I believe that we have this, I believe that this ballooned out of control um, at the total uh, responsibility and fault of the previous uh, last generation of city council. I don't know what was going on inside city council for the past 15 years that allowed this to happen. Um, as somebody who lives in Sun Valley where we have an oversaturation of the homelessness issue, uh, we have an oversaturation of RVs. Um, because the city council passed 8502, assuming that it would be okay to let people live in their cars and live in their RVs in the industrial area. Well, what I think that city council didn't understand is that in places like Sun Valley, some of our residential streets seep and run out into the industrial corridors. So while they might be allowed to be sleeping in your car and in your RV in the industrial corridors, that street is also a hybrid of residential as well. So I don't know why city council makes decisions without really understanding what is uh, happening at the community level. But I have every intention of working with all of the service providers to figure out who exactly are these individuals on our streets. Do we, we need to find out whether they are veterans, um, victims of domestic violence, mental health needs, substance abuse needs, so we can get them the programming that they need so that they can live sustainable lives and put them in a bed and teach them how to become sustainable individuals so that they can stay housed. We need to build the housing. I know that the predecessor to this office was not a fan of building housing, especially not emergency interim housing. I plan on building that in partnership with organizations like Hope the Valley because it really is the public-private partnership model that's going to help us finally get through this. Cool. <laughs> I wholeheartedly support the mayor's emergency declaration there for many years people had talked about doing an emergency declaration and it never happened and on day one she came in and boom made it happen and with the inside safe program and the new push I think for regional unity around this issue we're seeing some change and we're seeing some difference um, you know, as was mentioned, the previous member of this area was not very big on homeless housing, and I'm going to be the opposite of that, and, and that's why I have the endorsements of groups like Abundant Housing and the Carpenters, because I've talked about building housing in this district, permanent supportive housing, affordable housing, workforce housing. We know up and down Van Nuys where we are right now, there are vacant lots ready and primed for housing development. We're getting a new transit line here. It's gonna mean change for this area and our ability to bring more housing here at all levels, which is what we need to do. We need the mental care workers on the streets. We need the outreach teams. We need to actually clean up when we move people into housing so that the belongings and everything also gets taken care of. We need to make sure areas around our schools and our daycare centers, our parks, our libraries, our places where our kids are, that those are clean, that those are safe. And we do need to bring back laws on the books um, including 8502, because what it does is it says this is where you cannot have oversized vehicles and abandoned vehicles, and we can remove them. And people in those RVs and in those situations, they need extra handholding, extra assistance, they need to be moved into housing, they need to be offered things like vouchers to relinquish their vehicles, and we need to utilize our vacant parcels to actually move some of these vehicles and get them off the streets. And on top of that, we need to prevent homelessness from happening in the first place, offer emergency rental assistance to people, and, and help to keep them housed in the first place because we all know it's better to keep people housed than to fall into homelessness. Related to that, um, annual rent increases are currently prohibited 
uh, for rental units subject to the City of Los Angeles Rent Stabilization Ordinance through January 31st of next year, 2024. How will you expand upon these existing protections to ensure that tenants are not priced out of their communities? Amelda, please. How will you expand upon these existing protections to ensure that tenants are not priced out of their communities? So I do believe that we need to uh, continue to have um, rental protections where appropriate, but I think that the biggest solution to um, keeping uh, housing costs from increasing in general is by building more, uh, both uh, affordable housing as well as market rate. And while I know that there is a lot going on and in terms of the conversations about what the future of housing is here in Los Angeles, you know, I've always told people, my expertise is environmental justice, my expertise is um, youth justice, my expertise is getting people together and building coalitions that uh, don't necessarily agree on things. And given the hostility and the zero sum vibes related to uh, new laws that have been built related to what the future of housing looks like in Los Angeles. I'm excited to be a leader that goes in there and doesn't necessarily close out the door, close the door to people that don't necessarily agree with me. So what I'm excited to do in this conversation of housing is be the individual that is willing to talk to everybody um, to figure out what we can do to make sure that everybody wins while of course prioritizing, making sure that people are not priced out and pushed onto the streets, but also that we create situations where um, stories that I continue to hear related to, you know, it's not poor people that are not finding ways to make the, the, the rent get paid, but instead it's people that are uh, above in intellectual and finding ways to scheme the system so what I think we need to do is really work around how we protect um, individuals that you know, are being priced out of Los Angeles, but at the same time doing things to make sure that uh, housing providers um, are not forced to put the cost of a bad tenant onto the rest of the tenants that are doing a good job. Marissa? Well, again, you know, I think if we don't protect our runners, we're just going to keep seeing the homeless crisis expand and get worse. So I do believe we need to have pro programs like Right to Counsel, Eviction Defense, Emergency Rental Assistance for renters in this area. You know, um, I think that's why the Apartment Association and others have, have come up against me. Um, I, I really believe that, that renters need to be protected to the full extent of the law. And on top of that, you know, we can't really touch RSO because of things like Costa Hawkins and, and the state also has um, a rent control bill for buildings past 78. Sorry, that's kind of a wonky explanation. But point being that, you know, I, I would like to see additional uh, protections for our renters in our city. And I believe building is, is going to help with that. Um, and we need to cut down on the cost of building and we need to fast track building. And that's why I've talked about things like buy right development and pushing forward, um, having more projects and taking control away from city council and city hall so that we can fast track things. It's gonna make it so that we're actually solving the homeless and housing crisis. We can't talk about, oh, we need housing, we need housing, we need housing, and then make it so hard on people to actually develop and build the housing that we need in this city. So that's why I've said that I'm supportive of that, unlike my opponent. And I think that it's really gonna be necessary for us to build the housing that we need in this city um, as quickly as possible and, and do what we need to do to solve the homelessness and the housing crisis. such a short time since January, so we're talking about six months. How is this uh, state of emergency situation working? I live in CD11. There's been efforts to clean out uh, the embankments, but then two days later, um, they come back. There's a 
there's an inherent issue of people not wanting to be in the housing because there are certain uh, restrictions, uh, infringements to privacy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there are shelters available, but people don't want to uh, use it. How, how the, I want you to, as people running to fill this uh, seat, assess how it's been working for the past six months. Let's start with you. I believe the reason why people are, are, are giving uh, kudos to Mayor Bass is because you actually see her in the trenches of getting Lhasa to sit down, bring out the tarps, bring out the computers, and then getting the outreach teams to bring the individuals to their centralized location, inserting people into the CES system because unless people are in, into the coordinated entry system, it then becomes impossible to be able to say you are allowing yourself to be serviced. So I think that that's why a lot of people are saying that it's finally starting to, to work is because you're actually seeing the work get done because I guess she has a great communications team that's actually showing us that they're putting their hands um, involved in getting it done. However, for the residents of District 6, we have no idea what is going on. We don't see um, you know, an increase in loss of doing outreach. We don't see a reduction in the RVs or in the encampments. And I believe that that's why we need to get through this election so that we can start to work with Karen Bass and find ways to address the homeless crisis specifically for this region. You know, one of my things that I think is very frustrating, and I got this from my experience of working for the county, is that um, we're not very good at embracing technology in this city. One of the things that a lot of the service providers uh, for ho the homeless have been asking for, but the city continues to make excuses and the county continues to make excuses as it pertains to um, you know, sharing information, is that we haven't been able to create a way where we can identify where the beds are. If we were to be able to have an easier way of knowing where there's beds for the veterans, for the domestic violence uh, victims, substance abuse, mental health crisis um, individuals, then it would be much a much better way to actually enhance really addressing this emergency, but we're not gonna get there unless we start to embrace tools like basic technology that helps us map where we can get people services and a bed. I think part of what the mayor's program, the Inside Safe, has, has done that's been good is that they kind of used the encampment to home model where they weren't just using, you know, this, this coordinated entry system, but they were actually moving encampments as, as a group because a lot of times, you know, people get, build up their own community in these encampments and they don't want to move without, you know, their friends or their animals or, you know, the community that they've created. And so part of, I think, what's been successful about that is that she used that encampment home model, which I've, I've seen work in districts I've worked in, and we've moved entire encampments into the new housing solutions. So I think it's a great model, and I think it's one that we need to bring to Council District 6. You know, with no representative here, this, is, this program hasn't been brought to, to the area yet, and I'm very excited to, to be able to work with the mayor on it. Um, but you know, the, it, it is, it's a hard issue because a lot of people on the streets, um, and, and I'm sure it would happen to anyone, end up experiencing a lot of mental health um, issues uh, because they're there and they need uh, a lot more care and compassion and so that's why we need you know pe the, the county the state the federal government and others to help the city the city yes we can build permanent supportive housing yes we can we can lock arms and do this work together but it's really going to take a a bigger coordinated effort of the different levels of government. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful for the care courts. Uh, the governor said that they're gonna bring one to Los Angeles and I'm, I'm hopeful for that. And I'm hopeful for the new uh, state ballot measure that's hopefully coming to build more housing um, and, and care facilities in our state. And I think that's what's been missing. You know, we haven't had that since uh, Governor Reagan shut down uh, facilities many years in, in, the, in the 80s. 
right? So there hasn't been the necessary infrastructure and, and solutions in our entire state, not alone just our region, to actually solve this crisis. Thank you. Um, let me just do a quick run of show. What we're doing is we're getting questions from the audience that you know, great minds think alike because some of the questions are similar to what uh, uh, we had planned to uh, ask. Um, one thing that kind of uh, caught my ear and my attention is what Imelda just said that we don't, it, there seems to be lack of infrastructure in addressing this issue, lack of information, lack of data, lack of uh, everything. I, as a voter living in Los Angeles a few years back, voted for some measure. I believe it was M or whatever the letter was, where I'm paying more taxes uh, as a city of Los Angeles uh, resident to address these issues. So uh, as I continue to pay these taxes, these issues are uh, becoming more compounded and the issue, uh, the issue of homelessness, whether it stems from development or lack of data, et cetera, is becoming acute and as our mayor rightfully did, declared an emergency. Uh, how do we cut through the rhetoric, the red tape, and actually go to work uh, on this thing. So I'm going to start with you. Well, that was part of the beauty of the emergency declaration, right? It allowed some um, cutting of the red tape. I've talked to a lot of people who are in development, and they told me when their project had previously been stalled out for months since the mayor's come in, it's now been a week and, and they've gotten their, their new permits. So I think there's ways of doing it. It just takes a, a rework, um, and, and part of that is the new leadership from the mayor, um, hopefully the new leadership of, of the council as well, and, and us locking arms with our other regional representatives. Um, you know, I, I think you were referring to Triple H and, and Measure H, and while they, they were successful, they did build out thousands of new units. Um, you know, it's, it's not enough to solve the homelessness crisis um, that we're facing, but that's why it shouldn't just be incumbent upon Angelinos to, to solve it, right? That's why we have to call on the state and on the federal government to also provide emergency assistance to, to us if, if we're gonna address this. And, and like we said, it's, it's a compounding issue, right? If you don't have enough levels of various housing, affordable housing, workforce housing, we don't have the apartments, we don't have the units that we need, it's all gonna get compressed and it's gonna lead to more people falling into homelessness and more issues in our city. I think we all know that we have affordability crisis going on here, aside from just our housing crisis and other things going on. I mean, this is one of the reasons I wanted to run. There's so many problems facing our city right now. And I really feel that experience matters and, and trying to get someone in there who understands how to do property acquisitions and developments and budgets and do all these things and hit the ground running and try and bring change to our Time. community, that it's important. Yes, let's talk about experience. So for the record, I do have experience with acquisitions and budgets. I learned all of those things in my time also working for the city and working for the county and in doing things related to keeping Metro accountable for bringing resources to our region. However, what I don't have um, experience in is working for one government agency for my entire career and having nothing to say about the specific things that were done in this community that I'm trying to represent in. I've done a lot for this community. And I wanted to bring that up as a segue to also talk about, you know, in order to really address this, I think you need to have a leader that is unapologetic about leading. From the very beginning when I launched this campaign, I actually wrote out a pledge 
because of what we saw with those tapes. And in my pledge, you can still see it on my website today, I talk about how I plan to be a leader that is fully intentional, that plans to be intergovernmental, and also intergenerational. Every decision that I make, I plan to ask myself, how will this decision affect the seniors of today, the children of today, and the future seniors of tomorrow, and the children of tomorrow? And I also have experience in building programs from scratch. I was somebody that was invited by uh, three supervisors a few years ago to develop something called the Women and Girls Initiative, a model that today is still being replicated by different cities and counties across California. I'm also somebody who started from scratch on my own, a leadership conference related to supporting boys and making sure that boys took their future serious and didn't get caught up in you know negative things while they're in high school, but actually took their future seriously. And I did that for the course of over 10 years at Panorama High School. So everything related to the skill set Time. to be a leader at City Hall, I have it. I've shown it in this district. Let's, uh, let's move on to the next topic, which is uh, public safety. I mean, cr crime is, in, is a concern of Los Angeles, just as homelessness is, and many residents are concerned about the safety in their neighborhoods. Um, their, the district has a number of police officers, also turnover rates as well, and some be residents believe that the police force is not doing enough to keep the community safe. What are your plans for community safety, Imelda? for that and I think this is the, uh, the appropriate time to mention that I am endorsed by our firefighters of Los Angeles uh, an endorsement that I was able to earn because when I first went out to talk to them and I said that I wanted to earn their endorsement they gave me homework they told me do us a favor and go speak to the firefighters in your district and I did exactly that and by talking to them, I learned a lot about their needs, their concerns, and their desires, and how I can work with them in order to make sure that they are fully supported to service us here in the city of Los Angeles. Um, also, you know, I am someone that is no uh, stranger to working with our senior lead officers in the community, and I am also no stranger to working on things from the preventative side of helping young people stay away from things that get them a record. Um, I just mentioned it, right? I developed a youth leadership conference. That to me is work related to helping young people stay away from drugs, understand the systems of higher education, and finding mentors. Um, so what I plan to do is uh, have a, a good relationship with my senior lead officers and support them um, in identifying community leaders that are interested in establishing neighborhood watches. I truly believe that the neighborhood watch system is the system that really helps keep our community safe. Um, and I also hope to work with uh, different nonprofits that will partner with uh, our police systems and police officers in order to develop new models as it pertains to re-envisioning what public safety means. I'm a big fan and I think that it was uh, a big move in the step direction that the police union has identified 20, 20 plus phone calls that they no longer want to be in charge of um, and I'm ready to work with them to help them re-envision how those 28 things I believe it's 20, 20, 23, 25 things, um, building out a strategic plan of how we can figure out how to move Time. those to other departments or other partners. Well, I first wanna say, I think the thousands of workers in CD6 that have had pay rises because of our citywide minimum wage, who got hero pay during the pandemic, who have been protected by Fair Work Week in our city, our grocery workers, our hotel workers, our 800,000 member strong County Federation of Labor, I think they would uh, disagree with my opponent about my work not impacting this community. 
And in terms of public safety, I will say that, you know, I support our mayor's plan to bring us back up to 9,500 officers. At one point we had 10,000 in this city and now we're approaching under 9,000. Our response times are gonna get impacted. And when I talk to my neighbors and I know myself, if, if you call and you need the police to come, you want the police to show up and you want them to come in a timely manner. So we not only need to hire, we also need to retain our officers. We are losing officers at a very quick rate right now with nearby cities trying to recruit them, trying to poach them from us. So we need to you know, keep education bonuses, try and have our attention pay. We need to support our officers. And that doesn't mean we can't push for alternative models of policing. You know, that, that we have a circle program where we have mental health workers working alongside our officers that I think has been successful. We can expand things like community safety partnerships where we have more um, of our senior lead officers um, in targeted areas. I've helped to bring them to other areas of the city. I think CD6 could, could use them as well. We have things like PAL, the PAL program. We just brought it back to North Hills Community Park um, after some time, and I think it's gonna make a huge difference there. So there are definitely things we can do outside of you know, the just having police officers, we, we, we need to have youth programs. We need, we have summer coming, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a mom and, and I know, you know kids need things to do. So having those youth programs are gonna be very important. Uh, this is coming from uh, the audience and also was uh, also part of uh, our line of questions. Um, how are you uh, looking to engage the community, the Armenian community, in decision making, in uh, possibly holding discussions with them on a more regular basis? Uh, what do you plan on doing? And let's start with you, Imelda. Absolutely, and by the way, uh, for the sake of rhetoric, I think there's a big difference between impacting a community and doing the work in the community. Many years ago, I worked with the carpenters to do some backpack giveaways in the Antelope Valley. What impact it had, I don't know. To me, it was just about doing the work, right? That's who I am, I do the work. Whether it's in one community or another, that's just who I am. That's what community organizing is. Um, but to answer your question, um, I have been talking about it from the very beginning of this campaign that I am interested in creating community councils that are specific to subjects. So while I've been talking about having an interest in having a business-based community council, having a um, nonprofit community council, housing experts community council, I also plan on doing them um, as it pertains to specific um, communities. So I'm excited to uh, work with the Armenian community to have a council where they can consistently be in communication with me about what they wanna see in the district and what sort of things they want from me as a representative of theirs. But you know, one of the things that's also very important to me is making sure that in my staff, I actually hire people from the Armenian community so that it can be a consistent reminder um, and a consistent partnership of someone that is telling us uh, or telling me as a leader um, how I can make sure that I don't lose sight of um, building that bridge of bringing our communities together. I, I have um, five Armenian people currently working on my campaign staff and, and, and working with me uh, to, to already get out the word to the community and I plan to also have additional, uh, to have at least two staff on my council district staff who are fluent in the language and can make sure that they can make contact with the people of the district, make sure that there's no language barriers there and that they're informing me on, on the issues for the community. Uh, I would also say that, you know, just down the street from here, we have Van Nuys Civic Center. And a lot of people don't even know because it's been this kind of sad place that doesn't have a lot of community events or things going on, and I really like to bring that back, revitalize it. There's no reason we can't have more community events there, uh, events for Armenian community and other communities. Um, I've talked about bringing in immigration services there as well, which I think, you know, 
translates across a lot of different groups needing that type of assistance. And so these are types of things that, that I'd like to bring, like to bring council meetings back as well to that area. And I think just having all of these services and all of these things put together that we can kind of bring back more of more of a sense of community for for the valley generally you know we haven't had a lot of community um events and community things for all of us to do together and i think it's important to to bring all of those things back and you definitely have my commitment to having those events and to having that staff on board and uh hopefully like a uh, former Council Member Koretz, we can maybe have a center here in this community, like the fire building you mentioned. Uh, the elephant in the room, uh, and kind of the cause of some of the issues that we've uh, already discussed, is development. Uh, massive development that has impacted uh, affordable housing, uh, a lot of Armenians are small business owners. It's impact, impacting those small businesses. Uh, and we have seen that development, you know, excessive development has uh, created issues that now we're grappling with, not just you as uh, elected hopefuls, but we as residents of the city. What is your plan to kind of balance this uh, issue out. We're seeing these um, commercial residential buildings pop up. The storefronts are empty. The apartments are empty. But someone made a lot of money. Uh, how are we benefiting from those decisions that are ultimately made by the city council? And what are you going to do about it to balance it out so it does not affect the small business owner, it does not affect the renter, and creates a better environment in our city? Let's go with you. So part of the reason I, I talked a little earlier about, about pushing for things like buy right development is to try and take some of that control out of the hands of the council you know, there's been multiple scandals related to planning land use management um, at City Hall. And so if you take some of that discretion away, I think it will help to Im improve not just the, the public's viewpoint of what's going on there, but you know, it really will cut down on some of the, the problems that, in, in the building. And, and that's why um, you know, I think it's important because we will not just fast track <laughs> the buildings that we need um, for housing, but also you know cut down on that issue as well. So you know, unlike my opponent, I've said that I, I support doing that, and I I think that you know it's just it's it's got to be a balance. You you have to build the housing, um, and you have to build the the retail spaces and have mixed use and, and have places for people to go. Uh, you talked about small businesses and what we're going to do to help small businesses. Um, you know, as part of the Civic Center, we need to have small business assistance program there. We have a business source system in the city. It's supposed to provide loans and grants to our small businesses, but not everybody knows about it. So we need to do a better job of, of getting the services out there directly into the community. That's why I think it's so important for us to have them um, directly like in places like the Civic Center where people know to go to help um, to get that help to get that assistance whether that be you know small business grants getting their women minority business enterprise certificates um, helping with applying for city contracts even um, pushing for you know local preference to get more of our local businesses business and contracts with the city government um, because then we're keeping the money within our area and we're helping to, to fuel jobs and the economy and, and to, to bring everything back to, to our area. Okay, so currently, if you want to develop in the city of Los Angeles, it's very expensive. And it's very expensive because over the years, we have developed a lot of red tape as it pertains 
to the rules of development. And that, and because of those um, rules and red tape, you know, and a lot of it was developed by people over 20 to 30 years ago that made a lot of rules in hopes to reduce overdevelopment. However, what's happening now is that it's only those with the big pockets um, that are being able to negotiate, you know, building out so that their developments bring in money despite having the capital to go through all of that red tape and all of those loopholes. So I know it feels like overdevelopment is happening, but those developers are doing it because it, according to them, it's the only way that they can make a profit given the red tape. However, do I think that that's correct? Of course I don't think that's correct. However, what I am not 100% sold on right now is this new concept of eliminating as many of those mitigations as possible and introducing by right because what I fear is that we haven't fully fleshed out what by right will mean. And um, one of the things that I fear is that if we don't necessarily know what those new um, concessions will be by just giving away by right, I fear that we're gonna have people that develop things without things like incorporating green space, incorporating um, you know, water runoff mitigations, or uh, including uh, appropriate amounts of parking given the, uh, you know, to a rate of what, how many units they're going to build. Or what if they decide to uh, not incorporate um, you know, things related to accessibility for, for the disabled community. I have not been sold on this uh, by right campaign that is being pushed by the carpenters entirely because I just don't feel like it's flushed out. Time. But I'm ready to talk about it. I want to ask a more general question. Uh, we've talked about two pretty major issues in Los Angeles with homelessness, housing, development. Uh, what is, in your estimation, the most crucial issue facing Los Angeles, but more specifically, CD6 itself? Imelda? You know, I think, um, you know, there's, there's, it's definitely homelessness. It's the increase in, in crime. Um, it's the lack of jobs. Um, it's also the uh, lack of political will to really green up our public uh, utilities. Um, so, um, however, very specific to the region, and I've talked about this, is the city of Los Angeles doesn't prioritize um, taking care of its, its own assets. And you see that a lot in District 6. I've been talking about how you know we built out this amazing, beautiful skate park in Sun Valley in the middle of Sun Valley, Arlita, Panorama City, in the middle of a street where if you go uh, east, if you go, no, if you go, yeah, if you go east, you see all of these rich homes, people with horses. If you go west, you go onto Mulholland Drive, right? And it's people that have mansions. So you have the rich horse people on the east side and the rich on the west side. And we didn't do anything to protect this asset in the middle of the poorest communities of the East Valley. So I think that that's very important for District 6 is that we start to clean up our assets like our parks. I think we also need to um, enhance the, uh, in lar uh, increase the hours of operation of our public libraries. This is a community where the digital divide is very real. And if you have families that are working two to three jobs a day, and the only day that they could potentially help their students um, with their homework is on a Sunday, then we need to have our public libraries open on a Sunday for the sake of the access to the Wi-Fi, the research, um, and other um, assets. So yes, we gotta address homelessness, public safety, green up our public utilities and create more jobs, but we also need to take care of our assets. We have to. Marissa? Well, as you said, we, we've talked about homelessness and housing and, and public safety, um, all very important top, of, top issues for me as, as well. But what I always hear from people, from, from my neighbors, from the people I talk to just every day, precinct walking and, and, and phone banking and all of that, is that they want the city to get back to basic government services, that they want their trees trimmed, they want their street lights on and, and, and working, they want their streets resurfaced, they want their sidewalks fixed. 
Um, we need to get back to doing some basic city services for our constituents and you know, bringing, bringing back that, that level of basic community care. Um, and that includes fixing our parks and that includes in investing in our infrastructure. You know, we saw when we had a lot of rain recently and, and the flooding in Sun Valley because that infrastructure is not in place to handle that. We have a, a water crisis. People think, oh, we got a lot of rain, we're out of the crisis. No, we're not. We still have a drought and part of it is because we don't capture the water that we get. We haven't invested in the stormwater capture systems, but we, we can. We have a groundwater cleanup um, happening in, in Zahunga Spreading Grounds. We have Sepulveda Basin with this reclamation plant. So we have the ability to get us to, you know, some level of water independence and all of these types of infrastructure projects, these um, investments that we need to make for our, for our city, um, that's going to be um, the top priority for me and in and, 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 and this council office. Uh, thank you both. You're both very uh, engaging women. So I, since a lot of uh, our audience members might not know you or might not have visited your websites, I want to take a moment for each of you to uh, let us get, you, get to know you a little bit. Who are you? What do you do? And why are you running for this uh, uh, seat? Let's start with you. Thank you. So for those of you who don't know, um, I was born in Van Nuys and I was raised in Sun Valley. I'm a proud graduate of all of the local schools, the feeder school patterns that were related to where I live. Went to Roscoe, Bird, and Polytechnic High School. And from Poly Magnet, I was then uh, entered into UC Berkeley where I got a major in political science with a minor in philosophy and Chicano studies. I also have a master's in public administration from Cal State Northridge. And my family is um, a big part of who I am today. I come from a family of five siblings where all of the girls did very well for themselves. We went to good colleges, have very awesome careers, but I do have a brother that's also incarcerated. So I've always told people, you know, I, I come from a family where we showcase the best case scenarios of what can happen to our families and what the worst case scenarios is what can happen to our families because our families are working so much and there wasn't any assets out there that necessarily you know, saved my brother from the life that he ended up falling through. Um, that is, and it is that story of what my parents uh, did. My father was a gardener. For those of you who are here from the Sun and Tahunga area, my father was that gardener that you heard about on the news that had a heart attack and fell in a pool and it was a big scandal. I was the one who found them. So I am a person that has been through a lot. I was picked on as a kid because I do have a condition named Ricketts, so I walk with both legs and was picked on. But it was that experience that makes me be a fighter who stands up for uh, things that I find to be unjust. And I have always been active in my neighborhood. Uh, right out of college, I came to be active in the Sun Valley Area Neighborhood Council, something that no one told me to do. I did it all on myself, and it is actually that that made me live a life of advocating for water and addressing the, um, the, um, the flooding that happens in Sun Valley from a very young age. If I am granted this opportunity, I have already started talking to our supervisor, Lindsay Horvath, who has endorsed me on how we need to make sure that we get measure W dollars to the Sun Valley area to finally build out that park of Roy Shaw Waterlands Park. And I'm a, I actually applaud my opponent for finally talking about something related to water because no one on city council has started to talk about the importance of water until I decided to run and I put it on my website from day one. So thank you, I am Imelda Padilla, Jaliskense, bilingual, and I look forward to being your council member if granted the opportunity to earn your vote. Thank you so much. I, I too am a born and raised, very proud Valley girl. Um, maybe you hear it in the accent, not sure. But uh, I went to Birmingham High School, not too far from here. My daughter 
Uh, I'm a single working mom, by the way. My daughter um, goes to school in elementary school, just graduated kindergarten this morning. And so I'm proud, uh, proud of Mama Bear today. And you know, she's part of the reason I'm running. You know, I, I want to improve this community for for her generation and and for our children. They're first and foremost on my mind. Um, been and the rest of my family. You know, they all still live here in the valley as well. My dad immigrated here from Mexico in in the 70s. He met my mom here in the valley at a at a Mexican restaurant, and and they settled down here, and they raised my siblings and I here. And so, you know, my family's been here in the valley for for decades now, and and this is my home, and and it's important to me. And you know, besides the time I, I left to go to, to UC Irvine for my undergrad, and then to USC for my master's in public policy, I, I've lived here in the valley, and I wanted to take all my knowledge and and what I learned um, when I was away back here. And, and bring change and bring economic development and bring housing and bring park improvements and bring all the changes that we need for our community um, to, to the valley and to, to our area because this is, this is my community, this is the community that raised me and, and I love my community and so I really appreciate all of you for taking the time coming out tonight and um, look forward to, to talking with you after this and see if you have any other questions, concerns. I also would be very honored and proud to earn your vote in this election and please tell people generally to vote because we all know this is a special election, such low voter turnout um, and so we need everybody out there engaging in the civic process and, and pushing forward and um, you know otherwise we're not gonna get change in our community that we wanna see, right? So, thank you so much. Uh, we covered, I think, a lot uh, tonight, and I do wanna give uh, all of you the opportunity to uh, later meet with your constituents. Um, and I am gonna be harsh on this two minutes time. Oh. Is there anything that we didn't cover that you'd like to uh, talk about. This is a journalist and me. At the end of an interview, I always ask the person, is there something that you want to add? Let's start with you, Imelda. Sure, absolutely. So I think I'll, I'll use this to, to you know, kind of emphasize that you know, this is not an election that anybody was excited to have or to go through. Um, I know that when I launched, uh, at least for a good two and a half months, nobody was paying attention to me. Nobody was taking me serious. Everybody was telling me, you're not backed by a standing council member or any really institution. What makes you think that you're going to be competitive compared to you know, opponents that are supported by democratic clubs or by a standing council member? And I didn't let that get to me. I said, I'm gonna get, make this happen with the help of the community. And I am very excited that, it that I was the first um, candidate that was able to qualify for matching funds, getting 100 people in my district to uh, donate $5 or more. And it was after I got that that I was finally able to earn some institutional support, like the support of Councilwoman uh, Monica Rodriguez. Um, and after that, I also got the support of uh, another, uh, the, uh, the Union of L Laborers 300. And it was after that that I, uh, really captured some momentum and today I am very excited to say that I am the only candidate that is supported by multiple leaders that overlap with the region like Congressmember Tony Cardenas, Assemblywoman Luz Rivas, Senator uh, Carolyn Menjivar, uh, uh, Supervisor uh, Lindsay Horvath and I've also been able to earn the support of multiple unions in, in addition to um, Leona 300 firefighters, home care workers, nurses one to one, um, nurses national, United Healthcare workers, um, and the longshoremen's. But in addition to that, a pleasant surprise is that because I am a coalition builder, I was actually able to get the support of multiple business community leaders. And mind you, that I also worked on increasing the minimum wage to $15. I was the organizer that built uh, support around that in the San Fernando Valley. But because they know Time. that I'm accessible, I earn their support too. So I was the last person to get in into this election. So I was not tapped on the shoulder and I wasn't supported by 
anyone at first. I literally support, was supported by my family. They're the ones I asked, what do you think about this? Do you think I should run? And they said, yes, absolutely, 100%. You would be great in this role and you can do it. And I asked my family and asked my daughter what she thought. And that's the only hoople I asked permission for. And I told the people I'd worked with for decades that I was deciding to run. And they were actually all surprised. They didn't think that I ever wanted to do it. Um, but I said, you know what? If, if people don't step up who are doing it for the right reasons, who want to do it to, to bring change, and it's not about power, and it's not about the politics, then we're never going to see the change that we really want to see. We're going to keep seeing scandals happen time and time again in, in our government. And I just didn't want that anymore. I wanted to bring a new type of leadership. And I didn't work in government all these years with plans to run. I didn't do minimum wage or hero pay or sidewalk vending legalization or ban the box or any of these things with any grandeur or any plans of running. I did them because it was the right thing to do. I come from a labor household. My dad's a carpenter. My mom and sister are nurses. My uncle's a firefighter. So I did all these things to help uplift our working class families of our city and to try and improve things and to try to make them better. And I think that's why I have the support of the groups that I do, of the grocery workers, of the hotel workers, the electricians, the carpenters, you know, the, some of our healthcare workers, of the county federation, which has 800,000 workers under it, and all of these labor groups, and on top of that, uh, elected officials from across the region, African American, Latino, Asian, Armenian, our council president, Paul Kirkorian, our former assembly member, Adrian Nazarian, uh, Democratic clubs, Southern California Armenian Democrats, also the Asian Time. Democrats, New Frontier Democrats, and, and that's why they're behind me, and that's why I'm excited for this race, and I'm hoping for your support. Thank you everyone for joining us for this High Votes Candidate Forum for Los Angeles City Council District 6. Uh, and thank you Marissa, thank you Imelda for joining us. Uh, we hope that you found this forum informative and helpful. The candidates had a good opportunity to share their views on a variety of issues important to our community. These issues included education, housing, homelessness, amongst others. Uh, the candidates' answers reflect their provi uh, provided a glimpse into their respective platforms. And the, don't forget that the deadline <laughs> for all in-person and mail ballots is June 27th. So visit our website at highvotes.org to learn more about where you can cast your ballot. And just a reminder that this event was recorded and will be posted on ANCA's Western Region's socials and shared with thousands of Armenian constituents in CD6. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Marissa and Amelda. Thank you, ladies. Good luck to you on Thank June you. 27th. But whoever uh, wins will have to realize that the Armenian American community is part and parcel of this district and is shaping this district. So as leaders who are going to represent us, please do so keeping in mind some of the issues we discussed today. And you all of there, vote on June 27th.